Good morning, everybody uh, out there in Intro to International Relations land. Welcome to our lecture on international trade, the first of two lectures on globalization. Before we get started, just going to throw out a couple quick announcements. Um, first of all, and I'll probably be posting uh, something along these lines on Canvas coming up soon. Uh, but I thought I would reward those few of you who actually seem to be watching these videos by giving you a little advance notice. Um, what we're going to do, uh, I mean, the syllabus is going to continue according to plan, and then we're going to hold the final exam as scheduled. Um, since I got it here, right, uh, on April 30th. Uh, which is a Thursday, uh, 8.30. Um, so we're going to be holding that at the same date and time. Uh, it will be through Canvas. It will cover all the same kinds of uh, areas and material as the midterm exam, that is lecture uh, notes. Um, it will cover the Mix and Snyder readings. It will cover the textbook, and it will cover the news articles. So all those things. It will be, this is the big announcement, it will be open book, open note, whatever, but you are going to have the limited time that you have. So um, that'll be rewarding those of you who are um, who are uh, watching these, you're processing them, um, you're developing kind of an understanding of the material, and then um, you'll be able to then go and quickly consult back. Um, but it will be the normal exam uh, period, uh, which I think is an hour and a half for our, might be more than that, might be two hours. I have to double check that in terms of what the total time is. Um, but I'll put that in when I, when I come up with, it'll, it'll be 50 questions as well. Um, but it'll be through the Canvas quiz uh, function if you've done that before. Okay. Um, let's go ahead and get started then. That um a little manner of housekeeping taken care of so um what we're going to do today is first of all talk about what globalization is what it means and talk about maybe a term that you guys some of you at least might have heard and how it's different then we're going to talk about uh explanations for variance in international cooperation on trade so why do states sometimes engage in free trade sometimes engage in protectionism uh, three different explanations of of that. Um, so that's pretty much where we're headed today. Um, and we'll see in terms of how long this takes uh, in a in a world where I'm not um, interactive. These things all seem to vary somewhat relative to my um, experience in the classroom. OK, so first of all, what is globalization? So I've given you a definition here. Globalization is a, a historically unprecedented international flows of trade, money, and information and culture. I guess you could say comma information, comma culture, although information and culture are related. We're going to talk about information and culture on Tuesday. Uh, but for now, um, we're going to. Uh, and uh, you read about or assigned to read about um, international money in the textbook. Um, but today we're going to focus on the trade side of things. But what you need to know is that in the post-World War II period, we've seen massive increases relative to any prior time in human history um, in terms of the globe as a whole of flows of trade money and information and culture. So much more um, I'm not necessarily even saying, OK, if you were to just look at Europe at, you know, let's say in the in the couple of decades prior to World War One, um, pretty high levels of trade, but not global um, trade. Um, and what we're looking at today uh, for almost every country on the planet is really high levels of exports and imports. Um, it's going to vary, of course, depending on the on the economy. But that's that's where we are. Um, second thing is uh, what I want to be very careful about here is because um, these days there are some very strong critics of globalization on the left and the right. And um, 
some of those criticisms certainly have merit on both sides of the, of the political spectrum. Um, and, you know, if we were in class, we might have a little bit of a conversation about that. Um, but what I want to make sure you all understand in terms of what I'm talking about today is I'm not trying to convince you in any way, shape or form that globalization is a good thing or a bad thing. I'm just talking about different explanations for why it has occurred um, today and in class on Tuesday. So, um, and then uh, before we move on, there is this term globalization that as far as I can tell, emerged with um, uh, conservative, if you will, um, commentator Alex Jones, but um, now has been used all over the map, um, really. Um, uh, it's amazing actually how these terms kind of come about and then they start getting used. Um, I haven't so far at least seen any academics using it, um, but it is used out there in popular culture to um, generally, generally at least as a pejorative term for those who, who advocate and I guess, um, you know, they've got in mind some, some individuals out there who uh, uh, might advocate global citizenship and the end of the nation state and the doing away of, of, uh, of, of borders, et cetera, et cetera. Um, first of all, I guess I would just say from an analytic perspective, I think there's never been a point in human history where I, I would sort of argue um, or ever get close to arguing that that was somehow going to happen just from the perspective of what is and isn't likely. And second, I don't know a lot of um, uh, scholars, particularly political science scholars, I don't think I know of, of very many at all who think that that would be a good thing. But in any case, just to note, again, there's a difference between, um, uh, and this, the globalism point is related to the previous one, um, that um, most of our discussion today is really not about good or bad. It's not about whether you like it or dislike it. It's, it's uh, rather about um, what's happening and why. So when I say globalization is um, a historically unprecedented levels of trade, money, and um, informational and cultural flows, one um, example of that is uh, what's happened with international trade. So you can see here um, that in the post-World War II period, um, really, at that point, really what we're talking about is the democratic capitalist world because the um, the Soviet world, uh, Soviet bloc, um, did very little trade. But even within the, the democratic capitalist world, there wasn't a lot of trade um, as the countries emerged from World War II. World War II excuse me. And then as um, the uh, United States-led system called GATT, the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, that system started to engage in these rounds of trade talks that would lower tariffs, tariffs being um, taxes on imports, right? So if, uh, in that context, you know, um, and back in the day, it wasn't the EU in the, in the 1940s, it was France. France wanted to send the United States wine. They would put, you know, 20% tariff maybe on French wine, and then that French wine would cost 20% more than it otherwise would have cost. Well, as um, the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, the GATT um, process moved forward in time, there would be these successive rounds of negotiations. Countries would bring, basically what they did was they, they repeatedly brought, agreed to bring down their tariffs on imports and um, international trade blossomed. It, it, it grew pretty, pretty substantially. And then of course, with the end of the Cold War, you had more and more countries participating in the international trading system, um, such that you see the, the figure uh, making sure we all understand here that a trillion is a thousand billions. So that's a pretty significant jump uh, from 1973 to, to uh, 2013, just to give you a sense of what we're talking about here in terms of international trade. So um, I'm going to talk about three explanations now of why international, why countries might choose to engage in international cooperation on trade. Um, 
you know, bear with me because like I said, normally I'm doing this, doing this um, in a more interactive way, but I'm um, gonna, gonna, gonna work through this. So the first one of these is, is a neoliberal economic ideas in terms of why countries might choose to engage in free trade. Um, now, um, these ideas start with Adam Smith in his book, The Wealth of Nations, that most of you will have heard of, and then follow on writings by people like David Ricardo and others. And the fundamental claim that they're going to make is that um, there are efficiency gains uh, that occur when countries engage in trade. So um, that means that you're going to be more likely, all things held equal, to have um, producers making the highest quality goods and offer lowest prices when we're in an international trading system. Consumers are going to get high quality goods at low prices, all things held equal, um, uh, in an international trading system. So whether a country is more efficient in absolute terms or comparative terms um, on uh, production of a particular good relative to competitors, uh, trade is going to be more likely to lead to efficiency gains, right? So this is a kind of classic idea. It goes along with a lot of other neoliberal ideas like, you know, taxes in general are bad, um, that regulation um, should be kept to a minimum, for example. Um, but in this particular context, the idea is that countries should be engaging in as much free trade as well. Now we should note, that when Adam Smith wrote The Wealth of Nations, um, mostly what free trade meant um, was low tariffs. So he said before tariffs or taxes on imports. Well, um, over time, and this is where the World Trade Organization is today, uh, tariffs have come to mean not just, or excuse me, protectionism has come to mean not just tariffs, but protectionism can also refer to non-tariff barriers to trade. So non-tariff barriers to trade would include things like um, regulations that maybe are designed to be so finicky in particular um, that they make foreign producers have to tweak their products, you know, in in uh, in a particular way just in order to get into your market. Um, they can be uh, so regulations of those, and there's a, a pretty extensive debate on whether regulations. Oh, you know, the extent to which they're intended to be protectionist versus the, ex the extent to which they just produce, they just happen to benefit domestic producers. So, for example, environmental regulations, many people will say, well, environmental regulations are about the environment. Um, but when your domestic producers have complied with particular environmental regulations, I don't know, let's say on uh, how much emissions that they're allowed to in countries that, that are very focused on climate change how much emissions they are allowed to generate in order to produce X product. Um, and then you say, okay, sorry, um, you foreign producer, you can't sell in our market because you produced your goods at a much higher emissions level. That can be seen as, and can, can be debated as to whether or not it's protectionism or not, right? Some other ones that are a little bit more obvious, um, subsidies uh, are, are um, can be seen as uh, non-tariff barriers to trade. So subsidies when, for example, the U.S. government gives money to American farmers that allows those farmers to lower their prices, all things held equal, in order to make a, a, a profit or stay afloat, um, which means that um, they are going to be more competitive against foreign producers, either in the domestic market or abroad. Um, so subsidies are another example of non-tariff barriers to trade. And then finally, there are things like um, voluntary export restraints. So um, this was big in the 1980s where the United States negotiated um, with Japan on automobiles because Japanese automobiles were flooding the U.S. market for the first time and um, American ma auto manufacturers were taking a hit that um, the that Japan would only even try to sell in the United States X number of cars on an annual basis, not what the market uh, demanded. So. That's just a little bit in terms of the terms protectionism and free trade that I'm going to throw around today. Um, back to neoliberal economic ideas. So uh, Adam Smith and, and David Ricardo and other, um, I think Ric David Ricardo, I think Ricardo has two C's, by the way. Um, but Adam Smith and David Ricardo um, argued that there were efficiency gains to be made from free trade. 
um, that in and of itself doesn't tell you anything. That's all that tells you is that they were basically saying what states should do, right? I remember um, as an undergrad at UC Berkeley, I, I took this combined macro and microeconomics class and this, um, I was a political science major, of course, and, and uh, uh, took um, politics and political science very seriously. But this econ professor, when, whenever he talked about anything having to do with government policy, he would just sort of derisively say, well, of course, uh, it's so obvious that the uh, uh, economic efficiency would be massively increased if uh, we all just engaged in free trade. Um, well, there's a difference between saying that you should do something, that something would be best, and the, and the reality of what people, in fact, do. So that's where the next point comes into play, which is how did these economic ideas actually, how does that tell us anything about um, the outcome, which is countries increasingly choosing to engage in free trade and increasingly um, stepping away from protectionism. It's not that protectionism is gone, it's that it's at a much lower rate than it was in the past. So how do we explain that? Well, a uh, pretty simple uh, explanation is that uh, it turns out that these neoliberal ideas, economic ideas, were pretty powerful and continue to be pretty powerful in um, leading American and British universities. Well. What do we know? What we know is that the policymakers from, you know, many economies, certainly not all, but many economies around the world are trained um, in American and British universities. And then they go home and they say, gee, guys, uh, we found out that uh, uh, from studying at the University of Chicago that, in fact, if we were to lower tariff uh, barriers to trade, that that will be better for economic efficiency and we will prosper. Okay. So um, the idea is that these, as these ideas spread and policymakers around the world started to realize the economic efficiency gains and the growth, right? Well, they started to adopt these policies. Um, I'm just kind of throwing this out here. This, this last point is a bit of a new one because I was thinking, okay, how do we tell the story of why maybe there have been, because pretty much what we've seen in the post, post-World War II period is the steps forward in free trade, but certainly um, in the past, uh, you know, uh, period since, let's say since 2016, um, maybe even before that, but definitely since 2016, you've seen turns toward protectionism, right? In the United States, um, I'll just note parenthetically um, without commentary, but that uh, previously in American history, the Republican Party has been the party that's been the most in favor of free trade and the Democratic Party has been more skeptical. Um, now, I should note parenthetically as well that that changed, started changing a little bit when Bill Clinton was president because he endorsed uh, NAFTA. Uh, however, um, you have not seen the kind anything in the post-World War II period in terms of criticism of free trade and the international trading system, like what you've seen since um, Donald Trump was running for president uh, in 2016, but let alone um, since he's in, in fact been in office. Um, I will maybe just further note one little point, which is that uh, given that, or, or what, yeah, accepting that, uh, his actual policy outcome has not been grave in terms of the international trading system up until this point. That is, some people expected a lot more radical turn away from, from free trade than the United States has, has engaged in so far. Um, leaving that up to date, you know, your, the news article that you read for today, uh, there's a really great question about whether the coronavirus is likely to um, lead to more free trade or more protectionism. But this last point here is that uh, maybe the backlashes that you see against trade in the United States or in other countries, because of course it has happened elsewhere, it's just maybe most um, visible in the United States recently, um, but that they're a consequence of either individuals who don't fully understand um, the economic arguments for um, why trade is a good thing, or um, uh, those who question experts in general. Um, and certainly you've seen both of those uh, as, as relevant in, um, in, the, in the Trump period.
Okay, so that's neoliberal economic ideas, and there's a lot of setup there, so I think the other two are going to go a little bit more quickly. Neo-mercantilism. Um, so this is more of an explanation for not for the general trend toward free trade, but why um, countries at particular points in time and more, I guess what I would say is in particular sectors of the economy with regard to particular products in the economy might step away from free trade and engage in limited protectionism at least. Okay, so we'll start with um, Alexander Hamilton's uh, uh, 1791 report on manufacturers. Now, to kind of like paint the picture here of the world in 1791, which is uh, you had um, the United States facing, right? This is after the War of Independence. Um, but we know that at the time, the United States was still a, a small country um, facing a large and very prosperous Britain. Britain was the, the global superpower at the time, but definitely the dominant global economic power um, and the United States in the context that it was in was an agrarian and you know we would say relatively speaking backward economy British had advances in things like um, uh, you know textiles that were kind of cutting edge industrial revolution um, emergent industries um, the United States on the other hand did not and this was both um, a, uh, you could see how this both would have like a kind of immediate um, uh, economic consequences, right? But also fed into uh, American power. So the more prosperous your economy, the more you're in a leading economic, um, uh, you know, leading trend of the global economy, the more likely you're going to be able to build a powerful navy, for example, and raise a an army if you need one. Um, so Hamilton looked at the world uh, and he said, you know, um, like my country, I'm young, scrappy, and hungry, basically. Hamilton musical reference there. Okay, back to mercantilism. No, what he said was, um, the United States needs to develop an industry like uh, textiles. You know, we'll take that as an example. Um, what's the problem? The problem is, if we engage in free trade, uh, our, you know, um, small uh you know producers of textiles are going to emerge they're going to they're going to you know be struggling a little bit to figure things out they're going to produce textiles that are going to be all things held equal lower quality they're going to be pretty expensive when they initially start off because they haven't figured things out yet and they're just going to get slaughtered if they're competing in a total free trade environment with no tariffs against these british imports that people are already used to buying and that are high quality and relatively cheap so the only way that the U.S. can break into these global markets is through protectionism. We need protectionism to protect these infant industries. He didn't use the term. But this is the term that ends up being associated with the same idea of, um, of mercantilism is that sometimes you gotta, you gotta protect these infant industries, um, that are, that are critical to making the overall economy grow and being a cutting, cutting edge economy because that's critical to becoming a, uh, a powerful country that can also defend itself in economic terms. So there's a couple of different steps to the argument there. But that was the basic idea that Hamilton uh, articulated in the report on manufacturers. Um, so a couple of other ways that this uh, argument is related to little bits of protectionism, again, not that the overall economy should be closed to trade, right? We call that autarky. Merc Neo-mercantilists are not advocating autarky. Um, but they do sometimes stress things like relative gains over overall economic efficiency or even the F economic efficiency of one's economy. So they might say, look, when I say relative gains, what I mean is, you know, let's look at the U.S. and China today. So just so happens, um, and I do think this is relevant for the story that um, is emerging uh, in terms of the U.S.-China economic relationship, that China is not just Canada. Right. So if you took the Chinese economy and you put it in Canada and we're good friends with Canada, we get along well with Canada, they're even an ally. Right. Um, despite President Trump's occasional issues with Justin Trudeau, um, they are not an adversary. They are not a threat. China, on the other hand, is at least potentially a security threat to the United States. <clears throat> so when um, 
the U.S. looks at China, it is reasonable for certain policymakers, at least, to be more concerned with how much the United States is gaining relative to China out of that relationship, rather than just a question of economic efficiency. So is our economy more efficient than it otherwise would be if we didn't trade with China? Most certainly. I don't, I don't think there's even, if, and by the way, this is another neoliberal point to go back. Neoliberals are going to argue that even if the other side cheats, you're still probably going to be benefiting. Um, now, very few policymakers are going to are going to uh, embrace that perspective, but certainly um, neoliberal thinkers are going to make that case. Uh, but in any case, the the, the merc neo-mercantilist focus sometimes would be on relative gains, and they would say, just look, if if the U.S. if China is gaining more out of this than the United States is, and that more that they're gaining is potentially a source of threat to the United States, then maybe we need to back off this economic relationship, even if it's good for the overall economic growth of the United States. Okay, so that's the relative gains point. Um, it is, uh, yeah. S uh, final point to make here in terms of neo-mercantilism is that um, states may choose to engage in protectionism on particular kinds of goods that are so-called strategic industries, right? So think about, for example, um, uh, microprocessors that might go into a part of a jet fighter. Um, do we want to be buying all those microprocessors from China, for example, um, when the Chinese could put some bug or uh, some, you know, and manipulate those microprocessors in some way that then they become a vulnerability uh, in those aircraft or other, you know, um, uh, military products. So generally, this, the perspective is that oh, um, from, for um, critical military uh, hardware, we want as much of it either made domestically or made by our allies as possible. Um, uh, so that's, a, that's an argument for, for specific military products. Things like oil and food, things that are sort of essential. So we have this strategic petroleum reserve. We also are very lucky in the United States that we um, happen to have a fair amount of, of uh, oil domestically as we continue to need it, both for our overall economy and for our military. Um, but we also need, you know, in most countries want to try to have as much um, food, uh, you know, basic necessities of food on reserve, if, um, if uh, in the case, in the eventuality that that would be necessary. And then most recently with the coronavirus, what we're seeing is the importance of, uh, maybe from a, from a security perspective of, and there's going to be a lot of debate on this, and this goes to the Dresner um, article that you all will have read for today as well. You know, uh, do you want to be reliant on China for medicine? Uh, and and essentially what we've done is, um, you know, going on this principle of efficiency, uh, who can produce the, you know, high quality version of drugs at low cost? China can. And they have, and they and they do, and so they're responsible for the production of um, uh, an incredibly high percentage of global medicines. Well, maybe what you'll see emerge from this crisis, at least the possibility, um, is uh, the the desire to move at least some of that production um, back to the United States. It would, of course, make the the drugs more expensive, um, but you know, I could imagine that happening. Um, Dresner's argument from the article, you may or may not have agreed with it, is that essentially the profit motive and um, and the consumers, right? Because it's one thing, I'm going to get to this in a second when we talk about pluralism, but just right now on this point, um, it's one thing if you say right now, okay, you're paying $20 for a copay on a, on a prescription um, and fast forward three years from now and they're going to tell you that you're going to pay $100. Um, that's probably gonna that's probably gonna rub people the wrong way. Um, so uh, expect some backlash if if that's um, if if that's the the where the direction we're headed. Okay, last of our three explanations here of why countries might engage in free trade, and this one really has both. This one um, has the potential to really explain both protectionism and free trade. We're kind of kind of start um, with. Um, the 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 reason why protectionism um sort of the discussion i'm about to have here is let's assume a world wherein um protectionism is the initial status quo and then 
know, how do you get to free trade, right? So the basic story that pluralists are going to tell about um, protectionism and free trade is that it's a battle between the winners and losers from free trade. So I'm going to, when I say winners and losers, for the rest of what I'm going to talk about here, I'm going to talk about winners from free trade and win and losers from free trade. So if you were to lower tariffs, all things held equal. So imagine a world of, you know, this is probably the best way to think about this. Imagine a world uh, for the first part of this conversation, a world of say, you know, 1948, um, we mentioned very low levels of trade globally and the United States is considering whether to, to, to lower tariffs or not. Okay, so the first thing to say is in terms of winners, just who are the cast of characters here, right? So when we say free trade winners, what we're talking about primarily in terms of those winners are export oriented firms, that is firms who could sell abroad. And that's because there's a presumption, and this is the way it's worked historically, is that countries don't just lower their tariffs unilaterally, they negotiate lower tariffs with others. So I mentioned these uh, trade rounds where the United States got together with in the, in the um, early Cold War period, uh, basically most of its allies got together with those allies and said, hey guys, let's you know lower our tariffs, let's say on manufactured goods like cars, let's, let's lower those tariffs from you know, 25, 30% down to 20%, right? Not massive reductions at the beginning, but let's lower them. So who's gonna gain in that context? Well, American car manufacturers are gonna be able to sell more cars in Europe if the European tariffs on those cars are lower. Very basic point. Um, the reciprocity there, by the way, is that the other side is going to agree to lower their tariffs as well. That's just basically the highlighted word on the slide. Um, so that's the that's the that's the uh, the audience from a domestic political perspective. Because remember, pluralism is about domestic politics and telling a domestic political story for why this is likely to work. Now, consumers are going to get a, uh, um, the good. They're going to get the best quality good at the lowest price. All things held equal, right? There's more competition. Um, and so they're all things held equal, they're going to gain. Um, so they're winners as well. We're going to talk in a bit about why they might not be as important in terms of the story, but they're there. Um, and then free trade losers. So, um, whenever you, whenever you lower tariffs, right, um, import competing firms are going to, you know, probably lose some market share, even if they don't lose a ton. So American car manufacturers initially would say, yay, we get to sell in Europe. This is going to be awesome. And then um, as uh, the Europeans and others started to kind of develop in post post World War II period, you know, your Volkswagens um, started to enter the U.S. market. Eventually, your your Mercedes started to enter the U.S. market, et cetera, et cetera. Now you got Fiat, even, which, by the way, my advice, don't buy a Fiat. Um, workers in those import competing firms, right? So you hear a lot of this is a lot of the discussion about kind of the critique of globalization. Um, again, uh, if you got a world of 1948 where American car manufacturers are only selling to American uh, consumers, um, that's X number of sales. All things held equal, if they start facing competition, there's at least the risk that those import competing firms are going to have to lay off some workers if they can't sell as many cars, right? Um, so part of when I say export oriented versus import competing is whether if you have firms in the domestic market that are going to face competition internally, but they can't sell abroad, those are going to be the ones that are most vulnerable and the ones that are most um, liable to be losers, right, domestically, um, for whatever reason. Okay, um, and uh, right, the, the firms and the workers are both going to squeal. So why does protectionism win out, at least at the beginning, when we start with the status quo of kind of a high level of tariffs, um, like we did in the, in the 1940s, the mid-1940s? Well, first of all, um, the potential losers from a lower uh, a lower tariff. So those who are really concerned, you know, straight out of the, sh out of the, um, out of the, out of the, uh, at the beginning of the process, those that are really concerned about facing foreign competition, they're going to feel those costs almost right away as their market starts to contract, as they start to sell fewer um, units, whatever of their, of their product is, when they start facing that um, external competition. Whereas 
the, the prospect that a firm might be able to expand is something that is far more into the future and is um, uh, a lot less tangible and thus is going to make them less likely to really throw everything on the line politically to get that to happen, right, in order to get free trade. Whereas the firms who are really concerned, if they say, look, we know that there is a manufacturer of, you know, uh, baseball bats in Germany that makes a much better product and they make a, obviously this isn't the case, it's baseball's an American sport, but, you know, play along here. They, and they, or I don't know, beer, right? So Germans are good at beer. So if American manufacturers say, gee, if we lower our beer tariff by 20%, we're going to get crushed um, relative to German beer, um, then they're going to be going to lobby on Capitol Hill and they're going to be very vociferous in that lobbying, very intense with that lobbying because they know they're going to suffer the consequences. Whereas let's say um, there's an American you know, producer of a product that is um, that knows that they're going to be able to sell abroad well, that's a prospective thing, right? Are they going to be able to find the market? They're going to have to, you know, there's going to be a lot of steps that are going to be involved and it's into the distant future. So all things held equal, the losers have a real intense preference at the beginning and there's lots of them, right? Because all things held equal, if you're sealed off from the rest of the world, you're not going to be facing that at least international competition. Um, so there's going to be some inefficiency that is ripe for exploitation, all things held equal. Um, and then you might say, and this is what economists would be more emphasizing, what about the consumer? The consumer could benefit so much. Um, you know, and I will tell you, uh, even though, you know, I know that I don't look like an old man. Um, uh, when I was a kid, right, um, most clothing, uh, or m not most clothing, but lots of clothing was made in the United States, right? And what that meant was clothing was a lot more expensive than it is today right? That you couldn't buy a t-shirt for, you know, $5. So why is that? Why is it a lot less expensive today? Well, because we have essentially very low tariffs on clothing. Um, uh, but um, consumers who face a particular reality, that is, you know, a t-shirt that costs the equivalent of $10 instead of $5, they don't go and vote on the basis of cheaper t-shirts that they might get if they got lower tariffs, right? Um, and it tends to be, because these changes tend to be incremental, the price changes tend to be incremental. So the, the consumers, even when they benefit, they don't sort of go out and be like, yay, I'm going to vote for, you know, party A because they gave me lower tariffs. It tends not to work that way from a consumer perspective. On the other hand, like I said, with firms, if you have a firm that says, do not lower tariffs and they know they're going to lose and then they do lose um, first of all they're going to work very hard to to keep the tariffs from being lowered but then if they are lowered they're going to squeal really loudly as will their workers probably last thing to say though is the story of once this gets started because once it gets started and let's say you know, and it's not that the U.S., so imagine again the U.S. in 1948. It's not that the U.S. has no international trade in 1948. It's that it has very little. So let's say it's 5% of the economy or something like that, probably even less than 5% of the economy. Well, if that 5% grows to 10%, the point is that you've now got more firms that are export-oriented. They are focused on, at least as a part of their market share, maybe some of them, all of them, but part of their market share is selling abroad. So they then become interested in further lowering of tariffs, which will further help them sell abroad. So they then become as it, at each step of lowering tariffs and greater trade, that is less protectionism, you are empowering the winners from free trade, making them a larger percentage of the economy. And as they become a larger percentage of the economy, they become more politically powerful in a political system like ours where money matters. But even in a, in a regular democracy, they then probably are gonna employ more people and they would just, there would be more of a voting base in favor of free trade, right? All things held equal as people, you know, more people in the economy benefit from free trade. Um, and that would lead to sort of a steadily increasing cycle. Now what that um, leaves aside, of course, is the reality that 
um, to go back to what I said earlier, the reality we've been in since 2016, which is one where intense pockets of people who feel like they have not benefited from, from globalization will lash back. And you've got a, a real mix where much of society in the United States today benefits from globalization, perhaps in ways that it doesn't even realize. And so does it have a, maybe a firmly articulated preference for it? Um, but then you've got a small subsection of the population that feels really intensely that it's not working for them. And they can sometimes be uh, successful in influencing policy, um, such as, for example, in the administration's uh, trade war with China. So on that note, I'll let you guys go. Um, Peel, uh, feel free to uh, post comments. Haven't gotten any comments or questions yet. You can ask all kinds of, you can ask questions about the substance. You can also ask questions like, why do you keep wearing a tie? Are you wearing pants? Um, when are you going to cut your hair? Um, you know, whatever. Uh, and since it's Thursday, I have to remind you to stay off the drugs, please. Um, any illegal drugs. Uh, we definitely want to avoid those uh, to avoid, you know, putting any stress on our first responders. So there you go. It's kind of a PSA. And don't forget to wash your hands. I know my kids aren't, so I'm sure you guys aren't. You guys are dirty in general. So get dirty. Go wash. Ciao. Peace out.